like that. I wouldn't say that. I just do it. Oh. <laughs> You're so willing to. So uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for attending our session this morning. Um, the session title is Not One Right Model, Synthesizing Best Practices for Online Course Quality. My name is Amanda Hardman. I am a senior learning designer with the Colorado Community College System, where I also teach English composition. Eric? And I am Eric Richter. I am the Quality Assurance Coordinator at CC at Colorado Online at um, Job Chain just ha just happened. Plus, also I do teach it a lot of business and accounting classes. Awesome. So let me share a few uh, session outcomes for you, and then we will go right into our narrative here. So our outcomes are to articulate the need to synthesize multiple models and pedagogies into online quality standards, to discuss the value and limitations of a synthesized model, and to examine the learner perspective on course design decisions. Uh, so I do want to start a bit with a little bit of a background because that's really where the narrative of that synthesis happened. Uh, so in fall, in November of 2020, um, CCCS put out a report, a white paper, explaining how we were moving into uh, transitioning into a consortial model called Colorado Online, which Eric has already referenced. Uh, and, and so that would be a, a new delivery model for online learning within the Colorado Community College system. Um, by the next spring, uh, one of the first subcommittees in that initiative for developing the Colorado Online Consortium was, was developed, and that was the Colorado Online Learning Design Subcommittee. By probably summer of 2021, um, that subcommittee was kind of tasked with uh, different, different goals, um, and work groups were developed for those different goals. And so one of those goals was to develop online quality course standards for the Colorado Online Consortium. And that's how the base standards work group uh, was developed. So really our, our work began in earnest in the fall of 2021. Um, and that really wasn't that long ago. So uh, we did a lot of work over a rather short amount of time to do our review of different uh, course quality rubrics, um, different standards that were available across the system, and beyond to try to discern for ourselves what direction we wanted to take. Um, so, so again, we were charged with developing course quality standards. And it is important to note in that white paper that came out in uh, 2020 about the Colorado online transition uh, that Accessibility was identified as a non-negotiable and uh, the language of equity of access to learners across our system uh, was elevated uh, over and over um, to help guide our thinking. Okay, and, and I say that because uh, our system was already in uh, a relationship, most of our colleges across the system were already in a relationship with Quality Matters. Uh, we didn't want to just assume that that was going to continue to be the basis of our online course quality standards. We did uh, do work like Compare Quality Matters, which is subscription-based, to models like SUNY Oscar, um, which is open access. Uh, we also looked at models like the California Virtual Campus Online Education Initiative course design rubric, uh, we looked at what different colleges across our system were already using, um, like what Front Range Community College was using as opposed to Red Rocks Community College and, and so on. And most of, those, uh, most of those tools, if a college did have one, were already based uh, to more or less extent on quality matters. Um, so, so we took a range of uh, kind of well-respected rubrics, um, compared them with each other uh, before deciding that uh, we did indeed want to use Quality Matters as the basis. However, when we were uh, uh, when we were proposing this session, the language that we kind of 
um, latched onto in the call for proposals for this ELK conference was questioning the paradigm. Um, so, so this, this, how, how do we approach models without just assuming that what is presented to us, what we have available to us is the right answer, right? Or is the only answer. Um, and so again, with that idea that accessibility would be a non-negotiable under the Colorado Online Consortium with these um, elevated values of equity for learners, uh, we had to also take a hard look at quality matters rubric. And in that, uh, in that work, we determined that there were actually gaps in quality matters. And we couldn't just accept that paradigm without trying to address those gaps that we identified. And so that's when we started using, you know, we had faculty, staff in different roles across our, in our work group. Uh, we had a lot of knowledge, not just in design, but in pedagogy and uh, particularly in inclusive pedagogy, uh, culturally relevant teaching. Um, and so we took this knowledge of the different literature we had available to us, as well as established models like Peralta online equity rubric and frameworks like universal design for learning. We actually did a very careful crosswalk in fall of 2021 between the quality matters standards and universal design for learning guidelines and checkpoints to identify gaps. And from that work, we had to determine, well, what are the additional standards that we want to integrate or synthesize into Quality Matters um, to, to uh, create our Colorado online course standards? Um, so again, that was informed by our review of what's available, uh, the research that we all individually had uh, performed, had access to it, put into practice in our designs and teaching. Um, the emphases of the Colorado Online Project and our demographics and awareness of our learners. And I will let Eric speak to the data that we have here, but I want to add to this, again, accessibility was a non-negotiable. One data point that we don't have available in the CCCS data book is learners working with uh, disability access services or disability support services at the colleges. Um, but in efforts to reach out to different colleges to try to get a sense from them individually what the rates are, what the data is, we have identified that there is a gap between the data of students who uh, work uh, register with, uh, seek accommodations from disability access or disability support services, and what the national averages are. For instance, one college cited uh, that 6% of their students actually work with their um, disability access services department, while the national average is uh, more like 19%. So um, that, that really just emphasizes why uh, the Colorado Online White Paper might might take the position that uh, accessibility is is a vital um, element in the standards. Eric, do you want to speak to some of these other uh, data points? Oh yeah, I'll, I'll be happy to. I mean, piggybacking off of the disabilities aspect of it, um, with that, with such a high number in those size of things, the numbers that we have, those numbers came from 2019, so it's pre-pandemic, and with that. I mean, as I know, I have followed a lot of different articles that have showing that that number has increased a lot due to the pandemic. And along with that, community colleges do struggle with this aspect. And with our learner landscape, we have using our 2021 and 22 numbers, just over 40, just over 45% of first generation college students. I mean, that is huge. What do we do? Where do we go? How do we find stuff? Um, so that's why we wanted to look at a solid design process for this. And when we th when we're talking quality design in the quality classes in this regards with this presentation, we're not talking about the delivery of the content. We're not talking about um, mind blank. So we're not talking about the delivery of the content or what exact content it is, because um, that's up to the professionals, which is the professors and the instructors themselves. They know the material more than the 
designers do, but we want to make sure that we take the design out of it. So when you're talking about first generation college students going into this, they need to make sure that it's a fluid design that they go on. Oh, I understand what's going on. And then, you know, 39% of the individuals are Pell, Pell eligible, um, which is important. I mean, and then also 40% of our overall headcount of students of color, which is up five and a half percent since 2017. You also see the retention numbers there too. 51% retention of first generation, 49% retention of Pell eligible, and 49% retention of, of students of color. These are all very important things. The other aspect that looks at, which is fun, was I was looking at the age when they're pulling these things out with 27% under the age of 18. So we have a lot of concurrent enrollment. We have a lot of high school students that are used to having more of a design in class that is consistent in K through 12 education. Um, then 13% of over the age of 35, people coming back to college, looking back at college. Um, one statistic I thought was fun is we had like 0.7% of our students are over the age of 65. Um, that can be a really big shock if you haven't been in school for a while. So our learner landscape was very diverse and we wanted to bring them in, bring in a welcoming environment for them. And so one set of standards was not enough. And if you wanna to advance to the next slide, please. So this is where we truly begin to question the paradigms. Um, we leaned into our quality matters relationship, as Amanda already stated. Um, multiple year arrangement, I mean, spanning almost a decade. We've had a very deep rooted thing since fifth edition for them. Um, and then they moved to sixth edition back in the later teens. And then they're moving to seventh edition later this year. It's a really good astrology design rubric on how to make a good class. But we use that as a starting point because we needed something that is bigger, better. What fits our demographics? What goes to what we need? And, you know, the awareness, leadership, value expectations, the demographics of what we have is huge. Um, we want to make sure that people, that what we have for our classes will fit the needs of the students because retention is huge. We want to retain them. We want them to be better professionals. We want them to succeed because if they succeed, our society it, succeeds. And that was one of the values of the community college system of Colorado is we want everyone to succeed to reach their fullest potential. And this is where the synthesizing perspectives really came in to fill in those gaps. Peralta, um, UDL, all these other models that we wanted to bring together for what we have, we bring them in. This is, oh, I like this part. I like this part. I like this. This is fantastic. Eh, this one doesn't necessarily go as well. We've, we'll fill it in with this one instead. Amanda will get to that one in a little bit more. But what we ended up creating was a tailored model to fit our needs. Um, what fits our needs might not fit your school. Uh, and that, so we want to make sure we have what is tailored is a good thing. Oh, yeah. UDL, if you do not know, thank you for that one. A wonderful moderator. Universal design for learning is the UDL model. That's so everybody has the same basic needs that helps fit the equity gap. And we want to make sure that everyone is there. So we grab this model from different aspects and we tailored it to fit our needs. And we ended up calling it QM plus because we began with the basis of the subscription of quality matters. And then we added more to it um, as Amanda will get into here. Okay, so this graphic is just identifying what some of those major influences were that are um, acting upon this quality matters plus synthesis. Um, and I'm going to just put a couple of links in here. Um, uh, Eric, if you want to grab a link for quality matters, you, you can. Uh, but I want to make sure that the Peralta and Universal Design for Learning were represented. Um, Okay, so Quality Matters is the basis for our uh, QM plus Colorado Online Design Standards. And uh, again, to reiterate what Eric said, this is uh, based on our existing relationship with QM and realizing that QM was already fairly deeply embedded into many of our uh, individual community colleges in the system. And Quality Matters does give us very, very essential uh, core design standards. Uh, if you are familiar with Quality Matters, uh, then the language of measurable objectives and alignment will probably rise to the top of your thinking uh, for what are important aspects 
of online uh, course design, right? We, we start with measurable outcomes for learners and then ensure that every design decision that we're making uh, related to those materials, activities, assessments in the course are aligned back to those objectives. Uh, we want to ensure that there is that integrity of being able to meet the academic goals of the course. QM though also gives us uh, a, a baseline for understanding what sorts of structures and learner supports um, we can put in place to help orient learners and guide them through uh, the learning experience successfully. And QM also has a dedicated standard uh, related to accessibility and usability. Ultimately, we felt that uh, QM did not go far enough in terms of setting some accessibility standards. Um, and that is, if you peer down toward the bottom of this graphic with UDL, Universal Design for Learning, that model does um, give us a bit more um, in terms of physical interactions, keyboard navigability, things like that. Um, so the second influence on Quality Matters was diversity, equity, inclusion. Uh, we have that primarily represented through the Peralta Equity Rubric. Um, that was a major influence. The Peralta Equity Rubric uh, does give us categories specific to uh, becoming aware of and addressing biases within the course, um, ensuring that diverse voices are represented, including historically marginalized, um, voices, ensuring that uh, cultural backgrounds of our learners are represented. Um, and uh, I mean, Peralta Equity Rubric does have one criteria that just generally points to UDL as well. So there's crosswalk between some of these different models that are already out there. But if you look at Universal Design for Learning as a unique framework, Right, it's, it's not just about learner options. That's how it tends to get invoked, including within the Peralta online equity rubric. But uh, it actually extends beyond this to think about some uh, core principles of learning science, such as how comprehension and transferability of concepts gets uh, promoted within the course design. Um, and thinking about executive functioning, such as uh, ability to plan and kind of scaffold one's way toward a successful completion of um, those kind of projects and assessments that, back to QM, are aligned to the learning outcomes, right? So, so already in, in just talking about these influences, uh, I, I make cross-reference to each other, which is just, again, underscoring this need for synthesis. Um, that if we relied only on quality matters, there are pieces that would be missing. Um, and I, I think I saw it popping up in the chat. I, I'm not as good as looking at chat when I am screen sharing, but I, I think I saw seventh edition maybe of quality matters pop up. Um, and yes, that is a point that we are going to be making later is that these informing models also are kind of constantly under this um, this reevaluation and revision and the seventh edition the next edition of quality matters coming out in July. Um, the effort of that committee is trying to incorporate some more of these DEI lenses. Um, one person on the uh, subcommittee wrote a white paper for quality matters that pulled up these concepts of stereotype threat and validation theory and, and this is informing quality matters, but I, I think you'll find that there are still gaps in the seventh edition of quality matters as well, right? That that we still have a much richer kind of aspect if, if we consider uh, some of the broader efforts that have been out there in the field uh, related to these, these trends. Okay, so let me give you just one example of how the synthesis is happening to really expand QM plus we expanded quality matters. The problem, one of the challenges with using quality matters as the basis as the foundation for our standards is that we we can't change what's in quality matters. Right? We're still relying to a great extent on professional development that quality matters offers. So while we can expand and 
supplement in the synthesis, we can't actually rewrite what Quality Matters is doing. So uh, let's just take one example here. A specific review standard 4.5 under Quality Matters is that a variety of instructional materials is used in the course. This is a very important two-point standard in Quality Matters. However, the annotation for this standard for variety really emphasizes kind of different formats, right, that we're not relying on text alone. So with this annotation in mind, uh, we had lots of discussions. As you can see, this resulted in some robust additions. Uh, we had a lot of conversation about what types of variety we could pull out of, of this expectation, this, this standard, this aspirational standard um, that would have other specific benefits for our learners. So we did want to kind of heighten or elevate the universal design aspect of choice um, that text, oral, visual materials may all be provided to um, adapt to learners' preferences and needs. Um, we also, okay, so I, I like this example of 4.5 because we're not just drawing on Peralta or uh, universal design for learning, but other influencing factors in the field, right? So open educational resources. This uh, addition to our PLUS standards is informed by uh, of that review process we did to other uh, rubrics. So the SUNY OSCAR rubric does have a standard that speaks specifically to incorporating OER where possible. And the other influence on this PLUS standard was the work that the Colorado Community College System has already invested and done and established itself as a leader in open educational resources. Again, standards tend to be aspirational in a lot of ways. And uh, a standard like variety of instructional materials does tend to be very aspirational. Um, there are a lot of, of barriers to open educational resources for disciplines as well. But we needed to elevate it and, and ask those who are using these standards to really think about, did you consider? <laughs> like before just saying, oh, I can't do OER. Like, did, did you consider? Did you look? Did you investigate that possibility? Um, diversity of perspectives is another key area from the DEI perspective that we wanted to incorporate into variety. Um, and variety of perspectives can mean a lot of things. And in the resources and professional development that we are building out, we are acknowledging that, like diversity of perspectives can mean underrepresentative, um, uh, less popular viewpoints in the field, but we needed to elevate this, this DEI aspect, and this comes from Peralta Equity Rubric, um, is, but have you thought about whose voices have been silenced in your field? Um, because in a majority of fields that has uh, been uh, part of the history. And okay, my camera is in front of my slide, but the last plus standard here is also informed by Peralta Equity Rubric, which itself is informed by quite a bit of research in the field, uh, which is addressing biases and becoming conscious of ways in our design choices that we may be perpetuating versus trying to break down biases in our field. Um, and perhaps even opening up space for conversation when appropriate. So again, aspirational. You can see very well how, uh, how, how this is an aspirational rather than an approach like accessibility as a non-negotiable. But these are issues that we felt were so vital to be pulling out in a synthesis uh, to enrich the foundation of QM. So again, why it's just not possible really to rely on one one rubric alone. Um, I do want to acknowledge that um, in expanding Quality Matters, uh, we ended up moving from like 42 standards to 66. We, we really kind of blew up this, this idea of uh, what standards we were looking for. And thus, we, we did need to sort of reimagine what Quality Matters, um, not not how it was structured, but how we would communicate um, those kind of plus elements since Quality Matters wasn't you know, written to elevate DEI 
as a unique category, for instance. Um, so creating a synthesis kind of allowed us to do that. Like, again, we are using QM as a foundation. We continue to offer QM professional development, but we're developing our own set of professional development as, as well. Uh, and that is based around this re-envisioning of our standards as a healthy course checklist. Um, and with that language of healthy course, we are again trying to promote this idea that that we're offering some best practices. We're offering a synthesis of best practices. Although categories like accessibility may be non-negotiable, others may be a bit more aspirational. We've put a lot of autonomy into the colleges themselves for how they uh, incorporate these standards into their process. Um, so, so thinking in terms of, of offering as well, of course, as we can, healthy wellness, um, to our learners is how we have decided to position this in most of our communication. Um, so I had mentioned that seventh edition, and this is where I just want to come back to some of those primary models and recognize that even our informing models, our informing rubrics, our informing frameworks themselves are not considered final. And this is, again, with that idea of questioning the paradigm in, in mind. And it is actually through stakeholder groups, user groups, questioning the models that they're given, right, in light of new research, in light of new lenses that uh, researchers and practitioners bring to the discipline that enables this evolution to occur, that enables this reevaluation and revision to occur. So quality matters itself. Uh, as we've already indicated, is coming out with its seventh edition this July. That will certainly result in a ripple effect in uh, what our group needs to do to check our alignment and what we've established to be an additional uh, standard. Um, there are some cases where that will need to change. This is just kind of an ever-evolving process. Uh, the Peralta Online Equity Rubric itself has gone through multiple versions. Um, if you even follow the link I put in chat to Universal Design for Learning right on their home page, uh, they have announced it's actually an initiative that's been in process for a few years now, uh, but they're in the process of reevaluating the Universal Design for Learning framework through uh, equity lens. And even um, SUNY Oscar was not one of our primary informing models, but I even wanted to acknowledge that uh, SUNY Oscar and Colette in collaboration with Cal State has put together um, a DEI collaborative, an initiative to take uh, 54 inclusive uh, uh, design strategies of Cal State and annotate them and work to align them to the SUNY Oscar rubric. So um, some of these efforts that we are doing to kind of synthesize, expand, think holistically about uh, what concepts inform our online design standards it's happening through some other major rubric initiatives as well. All right. So, Eric, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. You can think through values and limitations. I mean, whenever you're talking about a synthesized QM plus model, any model, um, but then when we talk about a quality matters plus model, you're going to have, you know, positives. You're going to have negatives, you know, such as affordances and value. Um, one of the big things that I'm about, um, especially when I was going through my doctorate degree, it was bias management. How do you manage your bias? Um, I've been a Quality Matters coordinator for you know about four years. I've been a peer reviewer with Quality Matters for a while. I have bias towards Quality Matters that I think it is a really good product. How do you manage that with the synthesizing? Um, and with us being so deeply involved with Quality Matters, we wanted to make sure to manage that bias. And so that's why bringing in a synthesized model, we can manage that bias to make sure we have other output inputs and different people, different groups, the committees doing these things to manage that bias. Um, but we also wanna make sure that it's based in current trends and research. And what better way than to grab research from you know hundreds, if not thousands of different people looking into these things. What is the best for the current trend? Uh, sixth edition for Quality Matters came out Mm, 2017, 2018, maybe. So it's about five years old at this point. Um, a lot has changed in the past five years, just in case you just woke up and didn't know we had a few things with especially online learning happen the past three years. 
Um, sorry, I have to be sarcastic at times. Um, but making sure it's on current trends, what's going on, and then the rationales of it. Uh, there's a link in this that will show this, this PowerPoint presentation at the end, but the rationales that we use to what do we want to do in our synthesized model. Now, there are also some you know, other aspects of using synthesized. Um, alignment of additions to base model. Um, okay, we're adding this. Oh, um, where does that go? And so you're sitting there thinking, well, what, how to do that and making sure everything aligns to the research. You don't want to just say, well, I think this is a good idea. Let's just do it. Um, but if it's based in research, it's a lot easier to adapt and move. I mean, when we're talking over a thousand instructors and thousands, tens of thousands of classes per year within the Colorado Community College system, we want to make sure everything is based in something, where it is. However, with that, there is a lot of effort to track changes to informing models. We know 7th edition is changing. We know um, UDL is trying to change things. Peralta, everybody's just changing different things. And so it does take some effort and time and commitment to change those things. Now, there's also cost involved with this. Um, the only subscription one that we are using, sorry, I'm talking a little fast here. Uh, the only subscription one that we are using is Quality Matters, which does cost. And it's not, in, not an insignificant cost to get everything up and running with it, um, which is important. But other costs that are more hidden costs, I guess, would be a good way to put this, is time. How much time does it take to go track all those models? How much time to update everything? How much time does it take to align it? That's cost of employees and staff doing different things. The cost of training people. I mean, that is a time and a commitment. You really have to be committed to the synthesized model that you want to tailor for your own activities. So that's what the cost, the effort, the alignment. However, on the plus side, it's based in a lot more research this way. And it's easier to rationalize and we'd get rid of our bias with it. So that's why our synthesized quality matters plus module was very important to us to make sure we get all these different things to have the best product we can deliver to our students and our learners. And handing back to Amanda to show a little bit how it shows, how it comes across. Okay, so I am, I'm going to uh, come into uh, uh, one of our course designs, um, and it's it's really to identify some of these impacts on design. I just thought it might be useful to try to, to look at some elements of a design just to say, well, what if we were only relying on quality matters? What do we gain in the course design, and that's what the learners gain, uh, through application of some of these other models. So we are going to take a look at, well, I mean, you can see measurable outcomes captured on the screen here. We'll look at a little bit of alignment, um, but we'll look at some of these other choices that are integrated in, in I mean, not brain busting ways. There's nothing here that I think will be surprising, but just to think through what, what we gain by synthesizing uh, beyond just quality matters alone. Okay. So let me hope that I am still. Nope, we're all going to know your password. No, you're not. It's dot, 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 dot. I already dot, have it open. Ah, there we I go. I don't know, everything opens by default in Firefox, but I really use Chrome. So things I haven't bothered to figure out how to fix on my computer. Um, all right, so this is an intro to early childhood education course um, I've dropped into in student view lesson six. Um, so this should be the same view that you recall from the slide. Um, and we do begin with measurable module objectives aligned back to CLOs. This is quality matters, right? foundational concept, and then ensuring that these are aligned to all the choices in the course. Um, the major uh, assessment which I will uh, scroll down to um, in a minute is a value of play position paper. And these module objectives are directly aligned to that core assessment. Uh, the assessment is directly related to a set of aligned reading. So, I mean, there, there is some of that like tight alignment and relationship of the choices in the course that we expect through quality matters, right? Um, Let's see, but, but, and, 
and this, these choices really were all possible because of partnership with a faculty subject matter expert who um, just very ably took on that lens of um, inclusive design, equitable design, learner-centered design practices. So one uh, strategy that we incorporated was uh, trying to restate those module outcomes as essential questions that would be more learner-centered. And on a weekly basis, learners were asked to keep a journal, maintain a journal in which they just try to, in an ongoing way, answer those essential questions. If you can jot down notes based on your engagement in the course and answer those essential questions, you should feel very confident that you are attaining outcomes. Um, and then also uh, starting back in lesson one, students had a preview of the final project that they would be working on starting in uh, the last unit, unit four, um, <clears throat> which makes reference to those learning log entries. There's just kind of constant reminders back and, and forth that uh, every step that the learner is taking through the course is contributing to their ability to not only attain outcomes, but uh, to, to formulate and think through that final project. And that's 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 really um, a UDL sort of strategy in trying to guide that executive functioning and that um, process to, and progress toward uh, the, the activity assessment goals in the course. Um, let's see, so we have that alignment in this particular module. There was no graded discussion. So, uh, we, we had some discussion between the designer and the faculty subject matter expert about um, trying to open up spaces for communication, even when they aren't directed to do so for credit for points, what would be the value from a learner perspective, um, right? We often have these kind of general questions, discussions, um, but that's not often the space that learners kind of identify like, you know, if I'm if I'm making a connection specific to this lesson, specific to this unit, specific to this module, where can I discuss it? Like, is, is discussion just not valued uh, consistently throughout the course? So we wanted to open up some of those discussion spaces. And within our healthy course checklist, this really falls into uh, learner-centered design criterion related to generating community, ensuring that those social spaces are open. Um, but there's there is synergy here with uh, DEI as well, just kind of advocating that learners have a role, a consistent, constant role in um, uh, constructing knowledge uh, through the course and contributing to that community. Um, and, and then we'll scroll down just a little bit here. Uh, so the really the aligned activity for this um, module extends over multiple weeks. It begins here. It's aligned with the uh, lesson six outcomes, um, but we want students to go through a process. So we're guiding that process. We have begin, continue, complete sorts of indicators over the course of three lessons here. Um, but one thing I want to point out through these. Uh, through this particular module is um, that we were incorporating uh, tools like uh, activities, uh, templates, um, universal design for learning checkpoints. There are several checkpoints that identify uh, templates as important for guiding, again, that executive functioning, but also comprehension and an ability to make connections um, across modules, across lessons, across tasks. So I think I've got that. Yeah, so here's that little template, the play journal, um, making personal connections, making connections based on observation, um, a dedicated kind of guided note space graphic organizer for the readings. Um, there was a curated reading list that learners are interacting with and um, synthesizing in this project that they're working on over a few weeks. So I want to kind of hi highlight, elevate the template um, that we used. Again, in a quality matters class, I wouldn't necessarily need to see this sort of learner support, um, this sort of scaffolding in order for it to qualify or be certified as a quality matters course. These are additional uh, strategies informed by these other models of uh, DEI, of uh, UDL, um, to enhance and better support that learner's progress through the course. So that that's that's the kind of thing I'm just hoping to uh, show here um, with this quick little dive into a particular lesson. 
I mean, we also use strategies that many, many of you, I'm sure, use of um, offering uh, within a discussion different prompts, right? Scenario-based prompts. Um, they're just kind of that base level of uh, UDL, um, ensuring that there's options available. Um, but incorporating definitions that are central to apply within that scenario discussion is also a universal design for learning strategy of ensuring that that background knowledge or the core definitions, that, um, that uh, common language is like readily accessible to learners as they need it. Um, so, so I will go back to the slides here, but I'm hoping that that little foray into <laughs> uh, a, um, a designed module um, does kind of elevate this idea of we gain something through the synthesis um, rather than lose something in the course design and therefore our learners gain something as well. Amanda, before I get to this, Connie has a question in chat. I like how the module is set up. Could we get a copy of this module or a screenshot? Uh, so the screenshot is this one available in, in the slides, which I will post a link to uh, the slides on SlideShare. Um, as soon as we get to our final slide, I'll give you a link to our Pressbooks resource that um, covers Quality Matters Plus and our Healthy Course Checklist and a link to these slides. So uh, you can at least have a screenshot of the essential question version of the uh, module outcomes. So now we're talking about the Quality Matters Plus final. Well, is it truly final? And that is no, it's kind of like medicine, you know, it's a practice. It's always changing, always moving forward. Quality Matters usually revises the rubric every four to five years. Other models revise, revisions are prompted by trends, stakeholder feedback, and those sorts of things. Um, whereas Quality Matters Plus and the Healthy Course Checklist went through focus group stages, receives feedback each and every time is disseminated you know, repurposed for different review scenarios. What is going on? We want to make sure that our instructors have a voice in this as well. Not only instructors, the administration, students, all, everybody has feedback in this model so that we can always continuously improve with it. Uh, one of the foundations of quality matters is continuous improvement. Uh, that is something I live in my own personal life, but it is something that we also worked into this. We want to make sure that it always has a chance to improve. We don't want to say, hey, this is the final definitive thing. 10 years from now, using the same document just is not going to work. So it, we need to update what is new, what is going on, what happens if we switch everything to virtual reality classes. We're probably going to need to update things. We don't know. Um, so that's why we always take stakeholder use, feedback. How is it being used? What can we do better? As we're going to go through professional development in teaching other individuals in the system all about what the Healthy Course Checklist and Quality Matters Plus is, we want to make sure to get that feedback from them and answer any questions. And what, how does it affect this? How does it move with this? And if something comes up we don't know, we're going to find out. We are going to be a part of a group. We're going to move forward. So is this truly final? No. And the intention is for it never to be final because it will always need to be moving forward. Uh, Times change. Think about when the iPhone came out, when the iPad came out, um, you know, moving everything over, Zoom just blowing up so quickly. This is the things that we will need to focus on as we move forward. And that goes back to the cost and the effort to keep up on these trends, which we do are committed to doing in the future. So we do want to thank you for being with us. We're definitely here for any questions any models, anything else that we want to do, any any questions you may have, you can contact myself um, or Amanda at any time. And so. it looks like we still have maybe five minutes in our time. Mm -hmm. I know this is a lurk session, uh, but we're happy to take questions and try to answer them as well. Um, and I did just put into the chat a link to our slide deck and a link to our QM plus resource. And it was also posted in ever Discord. under development as well. 
and was also posted in Discord. They have for Elk as well. Yes, I managed to find my way into Discord last night. Um, <laughs> so if you do have any questions, you can put it in chat or you can unmute yourself. If you are just grabbing the links and heading off to the next thing, thank you so much for attending. Uh, but we'll be on for another five minutes if there are questions. And, you know, along, following with continuous improvement, you know, the feedback survey was just posted by a wonderful moderator. If you could please go fill that out, tell me how horrible I am will be fabulous. <laughs> uh, that is a good question. What about asynchronous versus synchronous versus by? I don't even know how to pronounce that one. I'm gonna just totally mess that right one up. There. Yeah, online instruction. Amanda? So our charge was to develop online course quality standards, but if you are familiar with the Quality Matters rubric, um, you may know that it is positioned as being applicable for um, both online asynchronous and blended or hybrid um, modalities. Uh, further, the seventh edition of Quality Matters coming out this July is updating uh, its special situations to include synchronous instruction in particular. Um, it's always been my position that most of the quality matter standards apply across modalities, um, including face-to-face -face instruction as well. And actually, uh, those ECE courses, those early childhood education courses, including one that I just uh, was previewing, um, were piloted by instructors uh, for Colorado Online this, um, this past spring. And one of the survey questions that we have just put out to those instructors related to the, the course design, the learning design, um, has been in, in what modality they were using that resource, which was based on healthy course checklist criteria. Um, because we, we found out just kind of informally that these courses themselves that were built for online um, delivery format have been used and adapted um, in other delivery formats as well, including face to face. Um, <clears throat> so while while we are positioning these standards as part of Colorado Online, they were approved by the Colorado Online project team. Uh, we certainly don't intend to restrict use in any way, um, as most of the principles that are informing these uh, criteria and standards uh, can apply across modalities. Does the learning design subcommittee include reps from community colleges? So yes, the Colorado Online Learning Design Subcommittee uh, all of the Colorado online subcommittees, learning design included, uh, are um, built uh, strategically uh, with representation across community colleges. So to include metro colleges and uh, rural colleges, um, to include faculty members, to include various staff members, uh, including administration, directors of, e-learning departments, learning designers, as well as faculty and staff, I mean, instructors. Um, the work that has come out of the learning design subcommittee, subcommittee including this day standard work group, um, also went through a process of being discussed with different stakeholder groups across the system. So that included uh, things like the online faculty advisory instructor council and included the state faculty advisory council. I'm trying to unpack the acronyms as I say them, <laughs> um, as well as an accessibility stakeholder group, as well as some others. So, um, so the group, the work group representing the subcommittee included multi-colleges and multi-roles, and then um, went through discussion periods of presenting and conversing with different stakeholder groups. And then this particular project went through um, a focus group 
I say you no, know, a pilot group um, of, of using the tool, the Healthy Course Checklist, um, on their course, giving feedback on it, uh, doing some adaptation. Before it was presented in May of 2022, almost a year ago, to the uh, Colorado Online Project team. This has been such a wonderful topic. Thank you so much for discussing it and seeing how you're building and iterating upon what you've learned. I really appreciate that. That's the process of it has been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, we enjoyed sharing our project and uh, please do reach out to us via email uh, if you have any questions. Yeah. Come up later. Yep. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. And, you know, Look forward to seeing you in more sessions, along with also, you know, potentially seeing people in person on Friday. Because I will be up there. Have a so. wonderful day. I'm going to stop the recording and see you on Friday, Eric. Yeah. See ya. Thanks, Justin. Amanda and Eric. Uh, really appreciate it. It was a great session. Thank you, Justin.